Um, so um, our next talk is from Chris Wilde. Um, so for those who don't know him, he's been in um, Lyon for a while. Um, so he's had a total of 25 years. Is that right? Where is Chris anyway? Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, so Chris has had um, 25 years in France. Um, he's looking at... Um, he's done the relationship between cancer, the causes of cancer both being from um, genomes, but he's, he's coined a completely new phrase called exposome, which is about the influence of the environment on cancer. And this word is being used um, across the field. Um, so, welcome, Chris. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much for this kind invitation. And um, it's been a wonderful morning. I think my main task is not to spoil the day for you. So I'd like not to, you know, not to send you away with the last talk uh, with a negative. I'm going to explore advances in genetics. Uh, this is an area of science that's really irreversibly changing humanity and the world we live in. Yet the surprising thing is this fundamental transformation, I think, is taking place without that much debate, uh, despite a sort of certain superficial familiarity with DNA. I mean, I heard even at the conservative conference during the week two uses of the phrase, it's in our DNA. Despite that sort of superficial familiarity, Many of the implications of DNA technology and the underlying science are, um, I think, not fully appreciated. So I have, can I get this? Yeah, there we go. Three objectives in my talk. Um, first of all, I want to show how genetics is permeating and changing many aspects of everyday life. So I'd like you to be convinced of the scope of this field. Secondly, I'm going to present a framework for thinking through what's good, bad, and indifferent about this, uh, this science and this technology. And I want this to be a kind of practical framework for thinking through the issues. And if I've got time at the end, I'll spend two or three minutes just saying where I think the church could play a greater role in shaping society and the uses of uh, genetic advances. And I like very much this quote from uh, Rubashov in the darkness at noon by Arthur Kussler. Rubashov is criticizing the Communist Party not being driven by values, human values. And he says, we've thrown overboard all conventions. Our sole guiding principle is that of consequent logica. We are sailing without ethical ballast. And I think that's a risk in this area of uh, uh, genetic advance. Right. A little bit of biology as we start. Uh, the DNA, the genetic material in each of our cells, is made up of a sequence of around three billion chemical bases. And these are represented on this slide by these letters A, T, G, and C. And these bases are paired and then twisted into this iconic DNA double helix that you can see on the screen. I'm reliably informed if we wrote down the DNA sequence of one of your cells, letter by letter, it would fill about 800 Bibles. So you can see the, the information content from DNA. And it's from this code that the genes are, are, are made up, and those genes, of course, produce the proteins that enable our bodies to function. One of the changes has been the, um, just the rapidity with which you can sequence a whole genome in just a few days now. And the cost, it now costs about 500 pounds. 20 years ago, it was closer to a million pounds to, to sequence a genome. So this, this technology is transforming the ability to sequence DNA. But that's not uh, all that can be done. That, so that's reading the code, just reading off the code. But there are other things you can do with DNA. You can copy that code through cloning. I'll spend a few moments on that. You can edit the code, you know, putting bits in, taking bits out. And also importantly, you can store the code in vast searchable databases. So when you see reports on genetic advances in the media, you can think of it falling into one of these four categories. 
And let me just give you some examples of each of those four categories, and in doing that, try to illustrate just how much this technology is permeated into everyday life. So first, reading the code by genetic testing. Your DNA sequence is unique to you, so consequently it can be used to identify you. And that might be in all sorts of areas, you know, in, in criminal cases, uh, paternity can be in identifying individuals uh, that have been killed in war, terrorism, natural disasters. We've also got direct-to-consumer genetic testing, which has exploded in the last 10, 15 years. I mean, just out of interest, how many people here have, have sent off their DNA for a DNA profile to an ancestry company? That's remarkable. This is not a, this is not a normal cross-section of the population. <laughs> You're very cynical. I, I've sent mine off just to see what happened. About five million people in the UK have, have done that. Uh, your DNA profile is going to be increasingly used in healthcare. Um, so, for example, in my own field, increasingly the cancer treatment you receive will be re a reflection of the, the DNA makeup of your tumor. Um, there's great potential in avoiding adverse drug reactions because of your genetic makeup by testing in advance of, of using certain drugs. Not, not all the applications are equally as valid. I think uh, I saw one example of turning DNA into a verb, see on this slide, to DNA your life. So this is the idea that you adapt your nutrition or your exercise to your particular genetic makeup. This uh, slide at the bottom here shows a Dragon's Den product, uh, the first genetically per personalized meal shake. I think that said more about the market than the science. Um, but the fact that you can categorize people by their DNA sequence means that you can select based on that sequence. I'll come back later in my talk to embryo selection to avoid genetic disability. But there's been all sorts of debates about whether this technology might be used in selecting individuals for insurance or jobs based on the propensity to develop illness or to have certain aptitudes. And it probably won't surprise you to see that some of this is making its way into dating websites, dating apps. This one I put up here, DNA Romance. People, they will match you based on your genetic compatibility. I think something to do with your body scent. That may seem far-fetched, but imagine if in the future there is some genetic information about your likelihood of developing early onset dementia. You know, would, that, would that affect the choice of your uh, partner? So that's reading the code. Copying the code, uh, cloning, this hit the headlines in the 1990s by this very famous sheep, Dolly. Um, and we got these images of you know, multiplying human clones, such as, I think these are stormtroopers from Star Wars. I never watched the Star Wars film, but that's what I believe they are. Um, the purpose was never really to, to produce individuals, human reproductive Cloning, although the efforts continue to refine the technology in 2018, in China, the first two monkeys were cloned, so primates. Uh, but you can see the failure rate shown on, on this slide that makes it unethical to think of trying this in people. The real goal was what's shown on the cartoon there in the center, which was to create embryos from a patient's DNA in order to have a supply of cells which could be used in regenerative medicine. Uh, and that was the drive at the time. But even this technology has been surpassed now by the ability to genetically engineer cells and drive them down particular lineages which, uh, which are needed to repair tissue. That said, animal cloning is, is on the market uh, for prized farm animals and pets. I heard of one Argentinian polo team that has cloned its horses, so they're all identical. And this is, uh, if you've not recognized, this is Barbara Streisand, who reportedly cloned her pet dog. Uh, I was intrigued. I thought she must have got like a two-for-one offer here, buy one, get one free. But, 
but the cost is about 50,000 US dollars to uh, clone a, a pet dog. For cat lovers, uh, it's half the price. So good news for cat lovers. Editing the code through genetic engineering. This is arguably the area where I would say the most advance has been uh, made over the last couple of decades, the most innovation in terms of the technology. Um, the DNA of all life on Earth is open to engineering. And the step change has come, uh, shown on the, the top of the slide there, with what's called DNA editing. So the first generation of genetic engineering was putting genes from one species into another. This is actually about snipping bits out of a gene and replacing it with a slightly different sequence. Um, and that's, that's really come within the remit of, of most biomedical laboratories, that sort of technology. A major promise of this sort of approach is gene therapy, a new era of gene therapy. This lady shown here, Victoria Gray, she was the first person to have some of her blood cells engineered so that she no longer suffered from sickle cell disease. Uh, you know, quite a remarkable achievement in, in, in science of uh, gene therapy. There is a high cost to these technologies, of course, and there's all sorts of debates around the um, equity and, uh, and use of, of, of funding. But nevertheless, that's the way the, the technology is going. Aside from editing some cells of the body, which is what happened with Victoria, you can also edit sperm or eggs or early embryos. And in that case, in principle, all the cells in the, the body of that uh, embryo, that, that individual, will be edited. This was, again, considered very dangerous, very high risk, because you can't be sure that the edits you want to introduce are restricted to the target genes. Uh, but nevertheless, this person, Dr. He Jiangku, uh, in 2018 in China, he announced that he'd gene edited two baby girls that were born, uh, mistakenly hoping that this would make them more resistant to HIV infection. That, that led to a, a lot of outrage and criticism. He ended up in jail for, I think, three years. Uh, but it was interesting to me, the debate at that time was all about the biosafety, the safety for the two little girls and for humanity more generally. Um, and I think that's been a standard pattern for advances in genetics. It's been, can we do it safely rather than ought we to do it at all? Quickly go through this, just some other examples of editing the code. Um, David Bennett, in 2022, he became the first man to receive a heart transplant from a gene-edited pig. Uh, so the, the pig had been modified genetically so that the heart would not be recognized as foreign by the recipient. Uh, he, he lived a couple of months with that heart. But you know, in the face of organ donation, uh, the lack of organ donors, the work on Z, what's called xenotransplantation will, will surely continue. And there are other efforts now to produce animal-human hybrid embryos, which again would produce organs that would be recognized as human in recipients. Uh, for many years, there's been a, a promise to reduce food insecurity by genetically engineered crops. I'll come back to that later. Gene drive, this is where you introduce genetic changes to, um, to create uh, sterility in, in a species. Um, one major area this has been, effort has gone in on is on malaria-carrying mosquitoes, so you can eliminate the pests through gene drive. Also, the gray squirrel. This is quite personal for me, having tried to feed birds in my garden for many years and being uh, thwarted by gray squirrels. You know, there's apparently a desire to, uh, to eliminate the gray squirrel in certain areas. There's also a fear of a completely new generation of bioweapons. Now that the genome sequence of things like uh, polio, smallpox are available, it's quite feasible to engineer those viruses to be more pathogenic. And that's uh, long been an interest of governments and their militaries. And, and also things like de-extinction. Can we take DNA from the, the bones of extinct animals and 
engineer back the, uh, the original species. And finally, the fourth and final area of genetic technology. This is probably the least recognized, but it has huge potential effects, and that's around saving the code in databases. Um, I think there are two main branches to this. One is patenting, and one is, uh, is the databases themselves. You know, it's really where the science and the profit and the reputation come together. There's a lot of money to be made here. Uh, there's a complex backstory about whether it's valid to patent and something that's natural. Um, but the main areas of approved patents have been both human DNA sequences. So this has been in order to develop medical diagnostic tests or new drugs. And also patents on seeds, uh, crops of, of commercial value. And these patents, of course, can encourage innovation, but they can also lead to a monopoly and a, and a barrier to uh, application. I think, I think I'm correct with this. It's at least a quarter of all human genes have at least one DNA patent on them at present. In terms of DNA databases, there's also been a proliferation of those. Uh, the UK police database now has 6 million people on it, so 10% of the UK population. Uh, the government is really interested in having an NHS database with universal coverage, and that's being trialed at the moment in 100,000 newborns who will have their whole genome sequenced, and also 5 million adults. Uh, and this has huge commercial value as well as research potential. And finally, there's those areas where we voluntarily include our data in databases, such as big research projects, uh, and again, um, these direct-to-consumer ancestry testing, you'll always be asked if you want your DNA data included in the database for research. Um, 23andMe received 300 million US dollars from GSK recently to have access to their database. So let's pause for a moment. I hope this whistle-stop tour at least convinces you of one point without tracking the details, that genetic advances are relevant to us now and in the future. They really are part of everyday life. This is not an academic exercise. But how can we make sense of such a diverse array of technologies and applications? And I wanted to develop a framework that allows people to think through these in a practical way. And the requirements I feel are needed are, are listed here. So a framework within, within which all genetic advances can fit, current and future. I think it has to be practical, so meaningful, relevant uh, to people. It should be value-based rather than technology-based. And it has to be an aid to thinking rather than a prescriptive set of instructions. And that's uh, why I've been trying to put together this idea of a relationships test. Why relationships? There are two main strands to my reasoning. The first is that relationships are central to being human. It's, it's at our core. We're often, we're partly at least defined by our relationships. So that universality gives us a very good common ground for debate within society. And I also believe there's a strong biblical basis for the importance of relationships. I mean, God's nature is relational within the Trinity, and that enables love to be expressed. And Christians are called into relationship with God and others. You know, one can argue that love is how we image God in the world. So I think relationships move us from a starting point of, of technology to a moral starting point. Uh, and one that's accessible to people both with faith and, and without faith. And I think the underlying question becomes what's written here. What action or decision allows the best expression of God's love? And I'm, I'm convinced that a biblical viewpoint has relevance and value well beyond the confines of Christian believers. Um, I was interested in this quote by Lord Rees, the astronomer royal and former president of the Royal Society. He said he's not a Christian, but he recognizes the value of religious thought on the sort of future of humanity. 
And he says the reason for that is that we are transnational communities that think long term, care about the global community, especially the world's poor. So in terms of areas of relationship, I've looked at four areas. Um, the first is our relationship with self. You know, how does genetic advance change how we see ourselves, our self-identity, our self-worth? Then there are relationships within families, relationships across society that shape society itself, and our relationship with the world, with the created order, with the environment. And I think if these areas of relationship are influenced by genetic advances, we should be paying attention. I thought the best way to try and illustrate this approach is to give a couple of case studies, which I'll, I'll go through quite quickly because I, I really want to illustrate the principles rather than focus too much on the details here. So the first one is, uh, concerns two areas of genetic technology, editing and storing the code. And the example is about genetically engineered crops. So the way I approach this is, first of all, to think of what are some of the underlying biblical principles. Um, we're called to care for and value creation in the role of what I've said here, a, a responsible gardener. We heard earlier this morning, I think Keith mentioned, you know, creation groaning as in the pains of childbirth. So something is wrong with what was very good. Uh, and therefore, acts of restoration or responsible use of nature, I think, are valid. Uh, just one example from genetic engineering, that most of the human insulin now for diabetics comes from genetically engineered bacteria. But to what extent and for what purpose might we own and modify living things using genetic technology? The, the, the science context, if you like, is just summarized here. I mean, the promises have been to combat food insecurity and more recently climate change through changing various properties of crops. Use is becoming widespread. I was quite surprised to see that over 10% of arable land worldwide now is for genetically engineered crops. So technology is with us. And it's moved from that first generation of inserting genes from one species across to another to this gene editing. And uh, post-Brexit, the UK government have enac enacted into law the Precision Breeding Act. Um, and the idea here is that gene editing is somehow more natural than the first uh, um, transgenic crops, you know, moving, moving genes across. This is a statement from the UK Secretary of, of State. So what about effects of this sort of technology on relationships? First of all, in society. I think there are two, two points on this slide, you know, inequality and control. So in practice, most of the genetically engineered crops have been aimed at wealthy countries uh, by companies selling both the seed and the herbicides that goes with those crops. And there's nothing wrong with making profit, of course, per se. But I think the problem comes when a false narrative is, is employed to introduce this technology. So we have to look at the underlying motives, really, and uses of the technology so that it doesn't increase inequality. And secondly, control over the vulnerable. Um, you know, multinationals have been purchasing many small seed companies, and that's reduced choice. And there is a suggestion that that might be pushing farmers particularly in developing countries, towards uh, genetically engineered uh, uh, crops. You know, three companies now, global companies, sell two-thirds of all the world's patented seeds. Again, another aspect of relationship within society is, uh, relates to justice. Uh, the patent law can cause farmers to lose the right to save and sow their own seed, and that's enforced by strong patents and surveillance and, and legal battles. Um, yeah, Brazil and India, it's, it's gone right to the highest courts in the land. And another aspect of, I think, injustice is, you know, the biopiracy of indigenous plants and knowledge. So wealthy countries taking the resources of the poorer countries and exploiting that for profit. And there are, there are efforts in this UN treaty to, to try and combat that. 
So that's relationships in society. What about relationships with the world? Well, you can think of things like the broad area of biosafety. You know, is the introduction of these crops threatening at all? Um, the, uh, the, what are the ecological effects? They're very difficult to predict. And, and sustainability. Um, a lot of these crops are really uh, made for large monocultures. They're not well adapted to the small farm setting. That's not, that's not unique to GE crops, but it's one of the features. And this can narrow the genetic diversity that we have in the world. And that means there's less resilience to change, things like climate change. So again, the UN have said that three quarters of the world's crop varieties disappeared over the last 100 years or so. I was quite surprised to find that 99% of all the bananas sold commercially globally are from one stock from, a, I think it's Chatsworth House in, in Derbyshire. Um, and so if a virus comes along that attacks that particular type of banana, you know, that's the end of the commercial crop. It's just an example of how this narrowing genetic diversity can, can impact. So that's one example. Very quickly, a second Second example around reading and editing the genes, this time from a human example and, uh, and doing that with our children. So some, oh, sorry, I'm out of sync now. It's a problem with looking behind me. So some, some biblical principles on this. Every person, I think biblically can say, is made in the image and likeness of God, uh, and therefore, is of immeasurable and inherent value. Every person is also of equal value, so no one should use another person as a means to an end. Children specifically are a gift from God to be nurtured by parents within their families. And the vulnerable in general should be accepted, protected, and provided for as we share one another's burdens. So genetic testing at the moment is used to select pre-implantation embryos. And the embryo gene editing that I mentioned earlier with Dr. He in China, that's debated but not applied. The selection is used to avoid children with a genetic disability or rarely to select a donor child uh, for an older ill sibling. So the, the little boy up on the top of the slide there Max Matthews, he was, his embryo was selected in order to treat his older sister who had a, a, a really debilitating genetic disease, so-called savior sibling. But this is moving beyond the, the health realm into widening parental choice, at, particularly at the level of IVF selection of embryos. So sex selection, which is legal in the US, and maybe even moving into other desirable traits. And this is really enabled, I think, by the IVF technology and the whole genome sequencing. I want to make a really critical point here is that most of the traits, you know, character traits or things like height, uh, body weight, eye color, these are not defined by single genes. These are defined by tens or hundreds of genes. So in practice, this is not going to be a very effective way but that doesn't stop uh, the science being misinterpreted or, or deliberately misused, particularly for profit. Um, so let's think here about the relationships involved. First of all, relationships in family. Uh, use this word commodification. You know, if, if parents are selecting an embryo for certain properties, I think that might alter the assumptions and expectations of the parents. Uh, we move to a sort of situation of selected and selector. And that's very much in contrast to a child being received as a, as a gift of a, a unique person of inherent value. Another one is inequality within families. Um, you know, will this disrupt the parent-child relationship based on an element of control and selection compared to being of equal value. I guess the ultimate in that would be editing your child's genome to your design. As I say, that's far from active currently, but 
just to give a sense of where the, the, the work could go. And also disrupted sibling relationships. You know, how do those two children feel that I showed earlier, that one that's been selected to treat another? Or, or, for example, if a second child in the family is selected in order not to have the same genetic disability as an older child. I mean, these are things that are hard to envisage, but they could disrupt relationships. So it's trying to think through these sorts of aspects with the technology. And it's, it's not theoretical. Uh, early in 2021, during COVID, this little girl, Aurea, um, was chosen by her parents among five available embryos based on having the fewest genetic mutations that would predispose her to some complex chronic diseases like cancer. Um, her father, Rafael, who's a neurologist, said it was really a no-brainer, which I thought was a kind of ironic statement from a neurologist. But he said it was a no-brainer. If you can do something good for your child, you want to do it, right? Um, so that, that sort of offer commercially is there in the States now from, from this company and from others. Okay, and then just uh, quickly relationships in society. Um, we can think about things like acceptance and inequality. So if we start to choose in this way, do we narrow what's considered normal? Is there less acceptance of difference? Things like accepting disability within society. Would we ever reach a point where there's coercion of parents to avoid the burden or the suffering of disability? Uh, the philosopher John Harris has argued intentionally, by which he means not selecting, intentionally having a disabled child is morally wrong because it introduces needless suffering. And then inequality within families, again, possibility of inequality in society, sorry, the possibility that the genetic background is used to, uh, to discriminate in various areas of, of life, jobs, insurance, and so on, even if the science is somewhat flawed. And, and at the far end of the extreme, and now we enter really the, uh, the sort of sci-fi area, I think this, this suggestion that those who've got the money to invest in their genome will slowly somehow differentiate into two subspecies, a sort of new Homo sapien Neanderthal split, uh, creating humanity in our own image. I think only God knows where that would end. So to conclude, just want to say one or two words about where we stand as, as, as Christians and as a church. I mean, in my scientific career, I was struck by how disinterested or unaware most biomedical scientists were about the difficult path from science to policy. Uh, you know, we had this image that ministers of health would sort of sit reading The Lancet, and they'd see this beautiful paper and then think, oh, we must do something about that, introduce this vaccine. I met many ministers of health and some heads of state, and it just doesn't work like that. Um, and I think that's some parallels with taking biblical principles to societal practice. Uh, we might focus on personal decisions, but even those will be shaped by the society we live in. So I think we have to think, how can we bring what I feel is very valuable perspective as Christians into, into practice? Um, We've got a large constituency. Uh, major Christian denominations, I think, can work together. There are two and a half billion Christians, and we share many principles, I think, with other Abrahamic faiths. But consensus at a, at a, a global level is like, likely to come through international treaties, and Christians need to be present at the table. Uh, a senior colleague that I had in one institute said to me, Chris, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Um, and, I, and I think, I, I'll just give you two examples. I've been involved in two uh, international considerations about germline editing, so editing human uh, germline, one by the WHO, 
and one by the Royal Society and the National Academy of Sciences and Medicine in the States. And as far as I could see, there was no formal representation of the church or, or of Christians or even theology at those meetings. It's not an easy task, and we have to be very sensitive because these are things that touch people's lives. But, you know, we can follow the example of Jesus. He was able to bring sacred values to bear, couched in love, in the midst of an imperfect world. And I think that's a, a good model. So I, I, I would really like to call on, on people to think through how we can influence uh, and shape society with, with biblical values. Uh, so my conclusions, applications of genetics are very widespread and they're significant, yet I think for most part we remain consumers and not critics, and that risks sailing without ethical ballast. Uh, there are many positive applications, and I, I've tended to focus a bit more on the challenges, but let's not forget the advantages of this technology but we have to look at the underlying motives and consequences. I do believe relationships can provide a valuable framework for us to think through genetic advances, both individual choices and societal. And finally, we're called to be salt and light, making our case clearly, but always with love and humility in the face of what are some very sensitive personal areas in, in people's lives. So uh, thank you for your attention uh, today. Thank you. Is this working? Um, thank you very much, Chris. Um, any questions? Um, thank you. You certainly raised some valid points, but maybe you raised them in a way that was rather oversimple. Mm. For, I mean, bananas, for example. The reason why 99% of our bananas are of one kind was that the previous kind all died off because of a fungus. Yeah. And there's now a risk that this one will die off of a, because of a fungus. So something needs to be done. But this is not really a question of a commer commerce monopolizing it. The kind we've got is really the only kind that was available at the time. And about children... There was a case, certainly, was it now 25 years ago or so, um, as I recall, the, a teenage girl was suffering from, let us say, leukemia, needed a bone marrow transplant. The parents, who are no longer young, went through various um, efforts and succeeded in having another child with the right gene type, which was very important. And... As, as the story went, um, in due course, that child would be able to donate some bone marrow, if I've got the story right, mm -hmm. to his older sister. But to say, oh, yes, we're just using the child as a means, um, ignores the fact that it was going to save another child, young person's life. So we've got to be very careful how we argue. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to spend too long on bananas, but the, the point I was trying to make was that if the biodiversity is narrowed, and it was the, yeah, Big Michael was the, pre Big Mike was the previous banana that was wiped out. So it's, it's a question of if the technology we're using leads to that kind of circumstance, there is a risk. That, that's what I was trying to say. You're absolutely right. The, the balance in terms of, you know, having a second child to save a first child, you, you are relieving the suffering and saving the life of that older child. I was trying to Maybe I emphasize too much the, the you know, the, the negative side of that, but I think, in fact, in society, the shift is more to, to do it, and the questioning is not there. So I guess I was trying to, to give that balance. But you're absolutely right. You have to take account of the benefits of in, you know, using that technology in that setting. And, and there's the example you gave, you know, there's only sort of a one in four chance that that, second child conceived naturally would be a good tissue match for the older sibling, whereas with the genetic selection, you can overcome those odds um, so you can select the, you know, the right tissue match. So it's a good point. Thank you.
Um, we've had one from uh, the back. Um, I think we've only got time for one more anyway before we go to break. Um, so should I get my DNA profile done with 23 and me? Other brands are available. Um, and if not, why not? I think you should know why you're doing it and what the potential discoveries might be and, and, and what implications that has for your family, actually. Because as you... I think one of the realizations is that information about my DNA leads me to know something about other family members. Um, and, and at times you can discover things you weren't expecting about your family relationships. Um, so I think the important thing is to think through those sorts of aspects, whether you want to go ahead and do that. And then the second thing is, before you, you know, click the button to say to put your DNA into the database, really to read what you're committing to by that act. So it's more the awareness rather than saying yes or no. I think it's going in with your eyes open. Thanks very much. Um, I was fascinated by the banana point. Uh, I once wrote a short story on uh, coffee, which has also got a very limited, how to bring down the Western economy and just knock out the coffee. Um, my, my point's more serious. Um, in the climate debates, which I've been very involved in, um, the early voice, or early Christian voice, was actually very strong. Uh, sorry, early, 1980s, including from Christians and science, uh, which led to the setting up of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, Nowadays, Christian voice in climate debates is quite weak, actually. But it did have a very, very strong impact. I don't, don't really see that in the genetic discussion. That's my first question. Is that there somewhere? Um, secondly, the question of what is the Christian voice? Um, my wife's uncle, actually, was the person who came up with IVF. And I remember the discussions we'd have in the pub with him. Um, you know, is this okay? And the church then was saying, no, it's not okay. Nowadays, with um, IVF, I think there are a lot of Christians who've got very much loved children that way. So the Christian voice can change. Mm. Um, all of that on biblical principles. So it's very hard to actually decide that. I'm myself personally strongly disabled and have been screamed out in the tube because I look odd. And I'm well aware that it would be awfully nice to have some sort of thing that could fix my problem, but uh, mm. it's a thought in the flesh, you just stick with it. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, my impression is in terms of the, you know, the engagement, um, I think probably the tail end of the last century, early years of this one, we had these you know, big headlines about the Frankenstein foods and designer babies and uh, all those, the, the, the cloning. And I think a lot of things were expressed at that time. My, my sense is certainly in the field of genetics for, for a Christian voice, whatever that is, as you say, since then has been rather quiet or muted. Um, and I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, but but those, those headlines that generated quite a lot of debate, I don't see an equivalent um, emphasis now. And that, that's one thing I was trying to say, that I feel that's, that's a failing. Then, of course, we come to, well, what, what would that voice be? And, and, and what would the position we take? I, what, I, what I think is important is at least to understand the question that you're trying to address, either personally or in society, and what some of the underlying arguments might be, so to be aware of when you go down a certain route that, that, that you are making some decisions that have some ethical dimension to them. Uh, so I think it's very hard to come to a, a single position, but I, nevertheless, I think, I think there's enough sort of biblical common ground that we can say more than we're saying at the moment. And I, I don't actually see a strong, uh, strong voice, but I, I may be wrong in that. It may be happening. In, in certain areas, and I'm just unaware of it. Quite feasible. 